the world is broken. That's how I understand the biblical concept of sin. The world and those of us who are in it are broken. Sin is not just the idea of personal choices, moments of disobedience for religious laws. It's woven into the fabric of human existence. It's, it's a part of who we are. It's a part of human relationships. It was my passion for the cause of Zion that led me to seminary study. And I felt led to go as far as I could go. I had questions I wanted to answer. I had people that I wanted to learn from. And this passion for what it meant to live the way God intended in the world drove my study. That led me to study peace and justice. And when you study peace and justice, you run face to face, headlong, right into the sin of the world. I studied in depth racism, sexism, homophobia, nationalism, sources of violence in the world. Why we organize human relationships this way. I studied how the world organizes us into winners and losers, to powerful and powerless, to oppressed and to privileged. I immersed myself in that world and I did it not just through the voices of people who are the winners in history, who write all the textbooks. I purposefully went to study with people and in places where I could hear the voices of those that we often miss, the losers, the oppressed, those who are marginalized and left out. And this was my world for nearly 11 years. I studied. And I began to see this privileged place that I, have in, I had in the world, not because I was me, but because when you study the sin and the structures of the world, I realized that for hundreds of years, as a white person, as a man, as a straight guy, as a Christian, regardless of any choice I ever made, I couldn't help the fact that I was always in a privileged position in the world's great struggles. And the more I learned and studied about this, the more I became dependent on God for a sense of direction and liberation and freedom for how to live out God's call in the world. It was in my last year of seminary, right around 2009, when I got this wonderful email from Don Compierre, who at, time, at the time was the dean for the Community of Christ Seminary at Graceland. And he said, Matt, I want to invite you to give the convocation address in January to the seminary for the university. And I thought, what an incredible opportunity. I was at the end of my doctoral studies. I had immersed myself in this world. This also would have been a great opportunity to put a little... Uh, uh, a line on my curriculum vita, which is like my academic resume. And I jumped at the opportunity. And so I decided to write a paper, an address, on John chapter 13, which is, if you're familiar with this, it's Jesus' feet washing. Now I want to stop for a minute, and I just want to tell you something about this. I'm about to tell you the story of how I became a Christian. I had always grown up in the church. I always knew God was a part of my life. I was incredibly blessed to have parents who had a spiritual outlook on the world and to be in a congregation, no matter how quirky and crazy they sometimes were, and the arguments that they would have that just made no sense to me sometimes. They still were a loving people. They still shared their testimonies. They still told me about who Jesus Christ was in their life and who the Holy Spirit was to them because they lived it and shared testimonies about it every week. I was surrounded by people who loved me simply for who I was. But I have to say I had never really been one of those people who had what they call a personal testimony of Jesus Christ. I knew God was real, but I didn't have one of those stories that said, Jesus is my Savior. 
because I really didn't even know what that meant. In fact, the people who talk like that often thought people like me, who went to churches like I did or grew up in congregations like mine, we didn't read the Bible right or we didn't believe in the right things. So God obviously wasn't on our side. But it was in the preparation for this convocation address that I found the living Christ in the pages of Scripture. And I want to tell you that story. If you're familiar with John chapter 13, it begins this beautiful story about Jesus' washing the feet of his disciples. But before we even get into that story, it tells us one simple fact that only you and me know as the reader, and only Jesus knows as we will see. Satan, which is the word in Scripture for the adversary, someone who's against you, the adversary had put it on Judas's heart to betray Jesus. And we get the sense that Judas had already decided that that's what, he, that's what he was going to do. It's from this fact that John launches into the story. And he does almost nonchalantly, passively, moving right into Jesus' teaching. He says that Jesus began to teach and wash his disciples' feet. And as you keep reading, the first thing you run into is this wonderful, memorable interaction between Jesus and Peter. Of course, Peter says to Jesus, you're going to wash my feet? And Jesus says back to him almost sternly, you know, if you don't want any part of this, you have no part with me. And Peter being the teachable one, I love this about Peter. He almost doesn't even know what he's saying, but he, I can see him throw up his hand and he says, well, of course, Jesus, then wash all of me. Peter may not understand what's going on, but he does the one thing. He sets the example for us who are reading, and that is, he trusts Jesus. The passage moves right past that and, and, and almost moves through the whole story in a sentence. And he says, after, John writes, after Jesus had washed his disciples' feet, and he moves on. And I realize in that moment that as I'm reading this passage, and if you're like me, you have a, a movie screen open up in your mind, and I'm seeing this happen. I dwelt for a moment in that passing passage. After Jesus washed Peter's feet, it's obvious that he would have ended up washing every disciple's feet. And in my mind's eye, on this beautiful big movie screen that only my imagination could, could create, I could go into the room where Jesus was washing those feet. And in that space and in my mind's eye as I dwelt in the scripture, I could feel the silence that was pregnant in that room as Jesus moved from disciple to disciple. After washing Peter's feet, Jesus gets up gently wearing the towel around his waist and carrying the basin and kneels down perhaps then to James and John. And in the teaching moment, you and I get a sense of the gospel. We, we know this story. It's not like we don't understand where this is all heading, but if you are in the moment of this story and understand the disciples, they don't know what's going on. This teacher, this rabbi, this word of God made flesh, this Jesus who is the revelation of God's will for creation, living out this message, has decided to take on the lowest station in the room, a servant. And he uses the gentle skin of his hands and the coolness of the water to simply wash the dirt off the calloused, hardened skin of the disciples' feet. And in the room, as I'm watching this happen, in my mind's eye, I, I, can, I can see the sense of revelation that is on the disciples' face. Some of the disciples are getting it and some of them are not. And as Jesus goes from person to person, I can see him look in perhaps James's eye and John's eye and kneels down. And in that moment of revelation, while they look at one another trying to understand what Jesus is doing, I can hear the trickle of the water wash over their feet and drop back down into the basin or the bowl. And there's 
revelation going on. There's learning happening. There is something at the center of creation taking place as he washes his feet. And as I'm imagining this, all in this simple sentence, Jesus washed all the feet of his disciples, it dawns on me, almost with a lightning bolt, that at some point in the story, he had to wash Judas's feet. You have to remember, the brilliance of the gospel story and the power of the narrative is that you and I and Jesus and Judas are the only ones who know what he's going to do. In my mind's eye, as Jesus gets up and moves one disciple closer to Judas, I can imagine Judas's heart beginning to pound and perhaps a bead of sweat begin to drop from his brow. Who knows what Jesus is going to do? Jesus might get to Judas and say, this is the man. He's going to betray me. He might completely out Judas as he gets closer. Can you imagine what would have happened to Judas if the disciples would have found out that he was the one who was going to betray Jesus? Can you imagine what they would have done to him? I imagine Judas was afraid for his life. In my mind's eye, as Jesus again moves one disciple closer to washing Judas' feet, there's a moment in the story where my eyes focus in on Jesus' interaction with Judas. And it's at this moment that I feel so close to the scripture. As Judas and Jesus make eye contact, and Jesus takes one step and kneels down to Judas's feet, Judas has to wonder what's going to happen. Jesus, I imagine, in my mind's eye, looks at Judas in the face. And in a flash of a moment, Judas knows what he has decided to do. And he knows Jesus knows. And it's in that moment of revelation that I imagine that the sense of judgment that has never been felt before by Judas washes over him. But it's not the judgment that comes from an angry God. It's the judgment that comes from the inside knowing what he has decided to do. It's a revelation of who he is to himself. And it's in that moment that Jesus then moves forward and kneels down and just for a moment takes his eyes off Judas's and washes his feet with the same loving tenderness and care and lowliness that he did every other disciple. And Judas has to endure the revelation of God's love on him in all its beauty and grace and even terror for what he's decided to do. It's at that moment in the story that I have this meaning of the Jesus that I never knew for the first time. And I literally pushed the scriptures away from me and I fell back in my chair. And with everything that I knew about the brokenness in the world, I sit back and I close my eyes and I say words that seem to roll out of my mouth as if they are not my own. This man can save the world. Not because he's going to save everyone from hell into heaven. This man can save the world because he has set the example for how to save the brokenness of the world if we simply follow his teachings and example and live like he did. In a moment like a deluge of rain in a desert, I began to see heads of state wash the feet of other heads of state. I could see Klansmen washing the feet of African Americans and Jews. I could see victims of abuse having their feet washed by abusers. I imagined all the ways that if we could just wash each other's feet, the brokenness of the world would heal and we would be saved, not by escaping this planet and creation, but by becoming a people who don't need to be saved anymore. It was in that moment that I stopped and I realized, almost with a laughter, I just became a Christian. <laughs> 
this guy can save the world. And I became absolutely convinced of the ways of Jesus as the way forward to peace and justice. I began to be aware that the grace that was revealed in the story of the man's feet washing of all his disciples, this God-man showed the way for all of us to be able to find our way through the brokenness of life together. It absolutely changed me. This is why I believe in being a disciple of Jesus Christ. I might be a trained theologian. I might be a priesthood member. I, I teach classes on these things. But deep down, what's most important and the greatest challenge to me is to figure out how to share his story and how to live like him. That's how I became a Christian. And that's how I began to understand the path to Zion. And it's my prayer that as a community of Christ, that's the path to liberation and salvation that we teach and tell. Because Jesus has come into this world, the God-man has revealed God's intentions for creation. He has revealed the kind of love and service, one for another, that absolutely can mend a broken planet, heal a torn society, and make people and communities whole. That's my prayer. Amen.